Um, you know, we've been talking about here on the show for a while about, you know, shipping shortages and these type of things. And it's interesting, of course, watching Hurricane Ida, what's happening. Two things happening in New Orleans, of course, right? Well, Louisiana right now, of course, Hurricane Ida, Ida is now a tropical storm. So that's good news, been downgraded. But this is now going to ultimately be the test of the $14.6 billion that New Orleans did to their flooding infrastructure after Hurricane Katrina. Of course, you know, the problem is not just the uh, wage surge, the, the wave surge that comes in with the hurricane. It's also the flooding that comes back as heavy rains go up the Mississippi and that water comes down back towards the Gulf. So. Uh, quite a bit of, of real worry here, of course, for, for Louisiana here over the next few days as we kind of sort through the rest of this, you know, this tragedy right now in, in New Orleans. But New Orleans is also a major port, right? So we already have these shipping disruptions uh, because of congestion and, and breakdowns and supply chains, etc. So this is going to be another impact to delivery times and of course to the supply chain itself because of the port operations in New Orleans. So, you know, this is something that is becoming a real concern. You know, I was joking a couple of weeks ago that, you know, you needed to start your Christmas shopping now because we keep moving Black Friday back, right? So <laughs> Black Friday used to be on Black Friday. Now it's on the Monday before the Friday. Uh, now it starts October the 1st. So make sure you start shipping, but in all seriousness, because these supply chains it may be the Grinch who stole Christmas this year. It may be difficult to get product in uh, for Christmas, so you need to start your Christmas shopping early. Now, this is a this is a message from your local retailers. <laughs> so, <laughs> start shopping now because consumer confidence has been dropping sharply here over the last couple of months. In fact, as the Fed, and we're going to talk a little bit about this today on the show, but of course. Uh, Last week on Friday, the Fed made their announcement from Jackson Hole. No real surprise here. No taper coming anytime soon. Uh, that sent the market on a bit of a rally on Friday to marginal new highs. But, you know, this is at the same time that that came out, the University of Michigan revised their consumer sentiment index, showing an even deeper decline in consumer sentiment than what we originally thought. And now consumer sentiment is back to the lows of where we were at the very bottom of the pandemic in March of 2020. So as we've seen all these extra monetary stimulus and benefits kind of end for individuals, you know, they're not getting $14 check anymore, so I'm not nearly as confident where my next paycheck is coming from. Unemployment benefits, of course, those are now rolling off in most states, and so people are faced with a choice of having to go back to work. And now that the Supreme Court has basically blocked the eviction moratorium, rent is coming due for millions of Americans who are way, way late on their rent payments for a lot of landlords. And that's a very interesting story. We'll talk a little bit more about this morning as well, because the Supreme Court found in favor of landlords. And they had a very interesting comment to say about that. Um, but what happened on Friday, of course, really the most important thing for the markets, at least in the short term. And the markets did sell off on Thursday over concerns that the Fed might taper sooner. And as we discussed in this past weekend's newsletter, Jerome Powell did say they're going to taper. But the one thing that got the bulls very excited on Friday was is there's a lot of work left to do here before we start raising rates. And that really what's got the bulls all excited here because that, that means low rates for longer, uh, more liquidity for markets. They're not going to be tapering anytime soon. They want to watch and see more reports come in. But the Fed did say they are going to start tapering their balance sheet sometime this year. But that could be a very minor amount at the end of the year. So again, more breathing room for the bulls, at least in the short term. Now, importantly, though, while we did see this rally on Friday, it was on weaker volume than what we saw on Thursday during the sell-off. And that's not surprising. This is what we've just continued to see is that sell-off days, uh, as minor as they are, um, have a much bigger spike in volume than buying days. And, and again, buying continues to be on very light volume here. Uh, the next big risk for the markets, of course, is coming up on October 17th when we get to options expiration. In fact, every decline this year so far has been on options expiration day um, as all the options that are out there come due. So 
again, right now the markets have just kind of kind of just floated sideways between option uh, option expiration days, get a little bit of uplift, and then when the next operation, options expiration day comes along, you get a sell off in the market. So that will be Friday the 17th of October. Uh, should be the bottom of the next sell-off in the market. So again, probably on the 14th, 15th, 16th, you're going to get a correction back towards the 50-day moving average if the pattern holds, right? So that's assuming that all else remains equal at this point. Um, now, some interesting thoughts, though, here is that we are moving into a, a, a very devoid area of no earnings, right? So we've pretty much finished the bulk of earnings season. There's a few companies left to report here, but the vast majority of companies have now reported. So now it's going to be really a focus back on economic growth, which is fine here, but uh, continues to show shines, signs of weakness. Um, we're seeing the Institute of Supply Management Index is getting weaker, uh, seeing a lot of the kind of underlying consumer trends getting weaker here as well. So we're already starting to see economic expectations of growth being ratcheted down here a bit. That will translate ultimately into lower expectations for earnings growth as we go forward. Again, expectation for earnings going into the end of this year, next year, very high, $189 a share for the end of this year, uh, $200 a share for the end of next year. Those are going to start to come down as we continue to see weaker trends in economic growth because there is a correlation between the two. Ultimately, since earnings are where uh, the uh, come from the economy because that's where you and I are spending money, what we're doing out in the economy, our consumption, that's what translates into sales. Sales translate into earnings. So if you have weaker economic growth, that will lead to weaker earnings going forward. Now, again, with valuations very high, if we get any kind of deterioration in economic growth or corporate profits, that's only going to make valuations even higher here, considering that we've not really had any type of price correction of any magnitude really since March of last year. So again, we never really had an opportunity to work off valuations at this point. It's been a, a very much a driver of higher prices on expectations of growth. Any disappointment here is, is a kind of a big risk. But Bitcoin as a savings vehicle, we'll talk about that, don't go away. So Bitcoin as a savings vehicle, it's kind of an interesting uh, thought, but a Missouri mayor, has a new proposal that he wants to do. There's 1,500 citizens in his, uh, in, in the, he's the mayor of Cool Valley. Cool. So cool. Cool Valley, Missouri, 1,500 residents. So the mayor of this town has, has this idea that he wants to give each resident of Cool County Bitcoin. And he's going to give them $1,500 worth of Bitcoin. And the goal is that they have to hold on to this Bitcoin for five years. So kind of an interesting approach to this, right? So I'm going to, so, you know, government here giving out money to people, right? That's, that's become kind of a new thing. Let's give everybody some money. So the goal is, is to give all the residents of Cool County some money but they can't sell it for five years. So kind of like an employee stock option plan, they've got to vest into it, right? So you get it, you just can't spend it. So it doesn't really help the economy very much. And we'll get into how he's going to pay for this in a second. But <laughs> here's the idea. I'm just, going to, I'm just going to read from the article because you can't make this kind of stuff up. I have some very supportive donors. We have agreed to match any money that I raise, being the government, um, up to several millions of dollars. And this was from the mayor of Cool County, Cool Valley, sorry. I'm trying to get a few government funds. Let me say that again. I'm trying to get a few government funds as well to go along with that or potentially some of the relief money that comes from the COVID relief. So basically what you want to do is divert money that was from COVID and you want to take money out of your county's government funding that's paid by taxpayers and give it back to them, right? Because this is all taxpayer money, COVID relief funds, government funds, that's all taxpayer money. So, okay, you're basically going to refund taxes you've already collected back to individuals, and you're going to give it to them in Bitcoin. But they can't sell it for five years. So what's the thought on this? Well, he's got a thought on that. 
He says, <laughs> source of the funding aside, of course, uh, Stewart said the generous Bitcoin handout will come with some strings attached because he doesn't want residents to sell it for a few years. Here's his quote. We're putting in place like a vesting schedule for Bitcoin. The idea is that maybe you don't touch it for five years before you really get full access to it. We're working on ideas like that because my number one concern, someone just sells their Bitcoin to pay for their car note, right? So I give them the money back, they turn around, they spend it. Okay, that's kind of the whole point of giving people money so they spend it and support the economy. But he's like, I don't want them to do that. I want them to save it. Well, he says, and when, bit, and when Bitcoin is sitting at like 500,000, now remember, Bitcoin's only at 50,000 today, roughly 48,000 and change this morning. So, and when Bitcoin is sitting at like 500,000 in a few years, they're really going to regret that they sold the money early. So his idea, kind of a Bitcoin believer here that, you know, if he just gives everybody some taxpayer money back, that in a few years in Bitcoin, it's 500,000. Now, look, I, that's, that's great, right? If you want to do that with your county taxpayer dollars and your, and your county, the people that voted for you is fine with it go for it, right? So you're going to give people 1500 bucks, and they're going to put it in Bitcoin and, and in five years when Bitcoin's a million. Let's just pick a number out of your, out of your hat, right? So just call it a million. <laughs> then people are going to have a lot of money, right? They're going to be... And, and, and what drove this idea? And, here, and here's really the interesting thing that kind of drove this idea. Here's his quote. I have friends whose lives have been completely changed, like going from working a regular nine to five job to being worth $80 million in a matter of just a few years. That's true. That happened for a few people that bought Bitcoin very early on when it was, you know, under $10. And it went nowhere for years. And that's fine. The problem is there's a huge difference from a virtual, you know, investment like Bitcoin as an example, going from a few cents to $10,000 and the multiplier effect of those rates of return. That's how you, that's how you get to be an 80, you know, make $80 million, right? You go, you're going from a few cents to 10 or 20 or 30, or in this case, $40,000, the multiplier effect, the, the, the compounding effect of that rate of change is huge, right? To go from a dollar to $40,000 is a huge rate of change. To go from $40,000 to $80,000 is only 100% return. Right, so you double your money at eighty. To go, so let's just say fifty thousand. That's great. I give people money at fifty thousand. It goes to five hundred thousand. Great. I've got you know a five hundred, you know, a thousand percent return. On, that's awesome, right? But that's a far different cry than going from a dollar to forty thousand. So, you know, it's the the exponential growth of what made his friends wealthy is not likely to happen realistically. Um, going forward. Now, again, it's, it's, you know, anything can happen, right? <laughs> we can talk about anything can happen. But the one thing that we don't talk about is what happens if it doesn't work out that way? What if in five years, Bitcoin's worth $25,000, right? And then, so all this money that you gave people that they've been locked up on for, for five years to, to get to is not worth half of what you gave them that's not really going to go well for your reelection. So there's there's a risk, you know, for the, for for this being done, but the idea is but this all goes back to this idea that we've talked about originally which is modern monetary theory, right? Which is where we use government money to give people money in order to create consumption or to do whatever you want to do. The the problem as always is the case is what do you do next? Right, because all we're doing is recycling tax dollars. We're not creating more money, right? We're not creating any new jobs because they can't spend it, right? So I'm going to give them the money. That's fine, but they can't spend it for five years. So I'm not going to create any immediate consumption or demand. So I'm going to take taxpayer-funded dollars that were meant that was meant to go or be slotted for COVID relief, immediate spending needs, right? Or 
tax dollars that were meant for repairing roads and bridges and doing infrastructure for the city, et cetera. And we're going to tie that money up for five years that belong to taxpayers to begin with on a regular, uh, uh, on a rather speculative investment on top of that. So it, but it's kind of just an interesting shift, right? The, the idea is, well, look, I don't have any problem with his idea, right? He wants to try to help the citizens of this very small county build some wealth. I think that's a very noble idea. I think that's great. Is it the best way to approach it? Maybe, maybe not. If you're a big Bitcoin believer and you think that Bitcoin is, is going to go to the moon, then you probably think that that's a great idea. Full disclosure, I own some Bitcoin. So maybe you think that's a great idea. The risk is that it doesn't. So, you know, and I guess the real question is, is, is there a better way as we look at the economy that we're in today? Are the approaches we're taking using debt and taxpayer funded dollars to try to give people money? Is there a better way to approach this? Should we not be looking at using taxpayer dollars to create apprenticeship programs to teach people to do skilled labor, welding, construction, auto mechanics, these type of things, plumbing? These are things, these are skill sets that people need every day. And, and you know, the thing about these particular skill sets I can't automate a plumber. When, when, when your pipe breaks in your house, can't really send a robot over to fix your house, right? Your plumbing. There are some things that just need to be done by humans. You know, construction is becoming automated. They've got automated brick layers and, and all kinds of things going on with robots now in construction. But there's still some elements of construction that can't be done by robots just yet. So should we be spending money creating apprenticeship? programs for these skilled labor jobs because that's one of the biggest complaints of manufacturers is lack of skilled labor. Kids don't want to do it. Kids are all going to college now to get psychology degrees and and degrees in, you know, human sciences and you know, you know other things that don't fit into the manufacturing sector of the economy. So should we be promoting and providing for individuals Saying, hey, look, if you want to become a skilled laborer, which we vastly need in this country right now, that's where a good use of taxpayer money may go to rather than just giving people money to spend this month. You know, using taxpayer dollars to build a better future. But these are the things that we don't think about because whether it's a mayor or whether it's a governor of a state or whether it's a House congressman or a, a senator, those have limited terms, and they're always up for re-election. And so if I want to get re-elected, I've got to do something now to make people feel better about me, right? Because I, I want your vote. So we, pin, we tend to do things that are the most expedient, but not, not necessarily the most productive in terms of use of money. We'll see how this works out. It'll be interesting if you can get this put together. We'll keep we'll we'll follow this story down the road. All right, be back after the break. Um, look, a couple of things going on here. Following the Fed meeting on Friday, what does this mean for the markets going forward? I want to get a little bit more into what the Fed actually said this morning and what that may mean for markets as we start getting into next year. And really more importantly, is the Fed about to make another monetary policy mistake? Don't go away. On Friday, of course, uh, was the Fed's Jackson Hole Summit confab. It was all virtual because of Delta. Nobody wanted to get in the same room with each other. <laughs> Maybe other reasons. But the general thrust of Jerome Powell's speech was really kind of summed up in one sentence that while they will be looking to taper towards the end of the year, there's still a long ways to go before we get to hiking rates. And this 
is why the markets rallied sharply on Friday because, oh, thank goodness, we're not going to tighten monetary policy anytime soon. But for the markets themselves, actually tapering has an immediate effect on price volatility. And we've posted some charts about this before, but it's in our newsletter this weekend as well. So that's one thing to consider, right? We're likely to see an increased level of volatility when the Fed starts to taper. But the problem for the Fed is that they tend to do things backwards. So if the goal is to have higher interest rates so that you can then lower interest rates going into the next recession, right? Because that's your best policy tool. So your two best policy tools to limit a recession is to lower interest rates and to do quantitative easing. But in order to do that, you've got to tailor that off first so you can redo it again later. And the problem for the Fed is they keep waiting too long. Let me give an example. Following 2008 financial crisis, terrible thing, right? We came in and started quantitative easing. One, along with a tremendous amount of government spending. We did infrastructure spending, $800 billion worth. We did uh, HAMP. HARP for housing. We did cash for clunkers, cash for washers and dryers, you name it. So we did all this stuff to try to rejuvenate the economy, get it going. And so the economy did recover. And the Fed kept interest rates at zero for nearly a decade. And they kept doing successive rounds of quantitative easing, driving asset prices higher. So finally, in 2017, they go, well, you know, we need to start tapering and raising interest rates. And so they started trying to raise interest rates. And in 2018, the market just basically threw up all over itself and said, no, you won't. And the Fed immediately lowered interest rates again and started another round of quantitative easing to try to keep the, the economy going. And again, we're not keeping the economy growing. We're just trying to keep it going and two different things. We're just trying to keep it stable. We're trying to just keep it out of a recession. We're not actually creating growth. If we take a look at economic growth since 2008, we've done about 1.3% on average. That ain't great. It's not recessionary, but it ain't great. So $43 trillion worth of quantitative easing, monetary injections from the government and the Fed and everybody else, and basically you've got about 2% economic growth along the way. So the problem for the Fed, though, is they keep waiting too long. And this is something we've written about previously. I'm, I'm kind of doing an updated version of this, the, the, of this article coming up here soon. But if you go back to 2010, right? So we did quantitative easing one in 2009. The market starts to recover. The economy picks up, right? Everything's starting to kind of hit on all cylinders. And then we do quantitative easing two because we were worried about the debt ceiling. Well, at that point, what the Fed should do is is that while you're doing all the QE, right, flooding the system with liquidity, start hiking rates. Use the influx of liquidity to lift interest rates. So lifting interest rates shouldn't be the last thing you should do. It should be the first thing that you do in conjunction with QE. Now, when you start doing that, of course, the financial markets aren't going to be, you know, surging 20 and 30 percent a year as we've seen over the last decade numerous times. But what you'll have is, is higher interest rates, which will lead to better rates of return for fixed income investors. It'll give them an alternative to taking risk in equity markets. And one thing that we already know is, is that zero interest rates don't produce a incentive for people to borrow money, not in terms of productively. Right. People borrow money to spend it because it's near zero. Right. You'll go out and buy a car or you'll buy a house um, because interest rates are low. But businesses won't borrow money to invest that capital into a productive outcome because the low interest rate environment impedes economic growth. It's destructive. Interest rates that are too low are not productive. There is, a, there is a balance between interest rates being too high where they're destructive or being too low where, they're, where they don't create an incentive for economic growth. And we're there. 
So the Fed should be hiking rates using that liquidity to offset the drag from higher rates. And so in, in my opinion, just my opinion, if I was Jerome Powell at the meeting on Friday, I would have said, look, we're going to continue $120 billion worth of QE for now. And I made the markets happy. And because we're now approaching full employment and because inflation is running at our target levels of 2%, we're going to go ahead and start hiking rates. In fact, we're going to raise 50 bips this meeting. Market would have sold off on Friday. So what? You're up 20% this year. The market's down 2% on Friday. Big deal. In about a week or so, the markets are going to realize that, oh, the Fed hiked rates. That's no big deal because we've still got $120 billion worth of QE coming in. So the markets may not rally anymore this year. We might finish the year out about where we are, but the $120 billion a month in QE will help support asset prices while the Fed starts hiking rates. And so you get your rate hikes back to a neutral rate, which in this environment probably get the Fed funds rate back to 2 2.5%, which would align itself with economic growth. 10-year rates will come up a bit. So economic growth will get impacted just a hair. But again, you still got this $120 billion a month in QE coming in. So now once the, the rates get back up and the economy adjusts to it, now you got to hang in there for a bit, right? It's like anything. You got to get used to it. You know, you got to, you, you, it's like, um, so I've been running a lot. This is a good example um, this summer. And it's been hot, right? <laughs> so when I first started running the summer more and, and further, it was really hot to begin with. I mean, I was just, it was killing me. But now I've been doing it so much this summer that I've become acclimated to the hotter weather. So it doesn't bother me near as much. And it's the same thing for the economy and for the markets. You've got to give time for the markets and the economy to acclimate to higher rates, and they will. We just we'll we'll uh, we'll just say okay, that's what they are. And we'll move on. And at that point, then you start reducing your QE. So now you've got higher rates. The market and the economy have become acclimated to it. We start to stabilize around whatever growth rate that's going to be, probably around two percent. Inflation is going to be running right around two, two and a half percent, right where the Fed wants it. And we'll get used to higher rates. Now, they're not drastically higher rates. They're marginally higher rates. They're just rates that are in line with the economy. Now, the banks won't be as happy because they won't be getting as much money from the Fed. But then the Fed can start reducing their balance sheet. And then when we do get to the point of having the next recession, which we will because that's just a natural function of the economy, at some point down the road, we'll have a recession again. Then you've got plenty of room to ramp up QE and start dropping interest rates back towards zero to help stave off the next recession. But that's just me. If I was Fed chairman, that's how I would do it. The problem for the Fed, though, is now that they've committed to this idea that we're going to keep doing quantitative easing and we might start tapering at the end of the year. And we don't know when we'll actually start lifting rates because we have a long way to go, according to the Fed. The problem is, is, is when do you start doing these things, right? So if you're, you're already nearing full employment in the economy from a historical standpoint. Inflation's clearly running hot. PCE, which is the preferred measure of the Fed, is already running at 4% annualized. So the inflation target is there. We're about to get another potentially strong jobs report on Friday. So the question is, is when do you start? And the problem for the Fed is if they wait too long, what we're going to see here is the economy begin to reverse a bit. We'll see inflationary pressures come down. We're going to see unemployment, kind of employment stabilize. It won't really improve much, but it won't get any worse. And we're going to see the contraction in spending already. If you take a look at savings rates for individual, that's returned back to the long-term trend of savings. And personal incomes are dropping back towards, and personal consumptions are dropping back towards longer-term trends. So this boost to economic growth that we've got is going to weaken. So when we get into next year, we'll be back towards 2% growth. 
And the Fed's going to go, what do we do if we start pulling away monetary support now? We're only at 2% growth. We were at 6, you know, 5 and 6% growth last year. Now we're now we're down to 2. We've got to keep this going, right? So now they're in the trap. And that's going to be the biggest risk for the Fed is, is they've got themselves into a liquidity trap they can't get themselves out of because if you try to pull it out, you wind up creating a recession, which is the one thing you're trying to avoid, even though recessions are actually a good thing for the economy longer term. Be right back after the break. So just for the break, talk a little bit about the Federal Reserve potentially walking into a monetary policy mistake here um, over the course of the next few months. We'll see what happens. Um, But if we go back in history, what we know is is that every time the Fed starts adjusting monetary policy, bad things happen for markets and the economy. Now, not immediately. That doesn't mean right away, but generally not too long away. So when the Fed actually starts reducing monetary policy and tightening rates, um, that potentially or technically does start the clock ticking for the next financial market upset. It's just a function of time at this point. So again, we wrote an article on this just recently. It's on the website. If you go to the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, and in the search bar at the top, just type in three things uh, for the next bear market. The article will come up and you can go through it. Um, so just kind of kind of wrapping up some thoughts for the day as, as really – you know, we kind of start looking down the road here. You know, one of the big concerns, and again, there's there's not any real concern right now, right? Bull markets uh, fully intact, right? Um, markets are going up. Everything's fine. There's a very high correlation between the market capitalization of the big fang stocks and the Fed's balance sheet because that money flows directly into liquidity. So again, as long as the Fed's doing their thing, no reason really to worry about the market, right? So the only thing we're talking about here is what happens when, and the Fed is now talking about changing that support in some fashion. So any type of negative change to the monetary policy structure is going to have a consequence for financial markets that are dependent upon the liquidity. I mean, it's just, it's just the way it is. So not worth fretting over and it's not happening today and the markets are just fine. In fact, if you take a look at, you know, really kind of more of your speculative investments in the markets, they've been doing very well as of late. Because again, there's still a lot of, expectation that markets are going higher. Great article in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend talking about the new kind of financial media stars on YouTube and podcasts and others. And these are young individuals that have no financial experience whatsoever. In fact, they do things like wear shirts to say, I'm not a financial advisor, or they self-deprecate themselves, you know, and they are saying, I have no idea what I'm doing, but hey, I'm buying this stock and it's going up. And they're getting a lot of traction. Millions of viewers. In fact, one guy that they were interviewing in particular made $5 million last year from his podcast. So he's making a tremendous amount of money doling out financial advice. He's a, uh, By the way, he's an ex-real estate guy now giving out financial advice. And so young people are watching these individuals who have no financial experience talk about, hey, trading stocks and buying this and buying that, you know, whatever it is. And in a market where things just go up, the more speculative the investment, the better because it goes up more, right? So more people watch them. It's great. And in fact, one thing that was was interesting about this is that these podcasts must be bullish all the time. In fact, they were interviewing this one one gentleman, and and he said, yeah, he says, I talk negatively about AMC, and I shed 20,000 subscribers in a day because people don't want to hear that. Don't want to hear the reality of how markets work, right? Don't talk about risk. Don't talk about markets going down. Don't, don't, don't worry about that because markets can only go up. And look, I need that confirm. And this is all this is, right? It's confirmation bias. I'm invested in a lot of risk. 
So don't tell me why I might lose money. Tell me why I'll make money. And that feeds the psychological behavior, right? It's called confirmation bias. We only want to hear the good stuff. You know, the fact that AMC is a good example of this, and even despite the fact that people are getting vaccinated and the fact that, you know, we're getting back out in the world, people aren't going back to theaters in droves like they were. There are people going back, but again, you know, used to on an opening weekend of a big movie, you know, couldn't get seats. They were sold out. Now you can wait till the last minute, walk up to the ticket counter and get tickets. And it's just, there's plenty of seats. The theater might be half full. That's very hard to justify the valuations based on income of a movie theater chain that is heavily dependent upon employees and physical locations and rent that's due, all that stuff, right? Maintenance, upkeep. These are not small facilities, right? These are 24 screen theaters, big, require a lot of maintenance, upkeep, et cetera. It's all a cost. But individuals don't want to hear that part. They want to hear how AMC is going to go to the moon for some reason. Right. So don't talk about the reality of the business. Just tell me why it's going to go up. And, and this is the mentality that we're in. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with this at all. Right. But this is the con this is the the psychological confirmation bias loop that we are caught in currently. Look, watch CNBC every day. Why markets are going to go up. S&P 5000. That's the new target now. Right, so we're at forty five hundred on the S and P. So why not five thousand? Nice round number. Very bullish. Another five hundred points on the S and P. That's only you know less than ten percent from here. It's like seven percent from here. We'll be at five thousand in no time. So it's a number, right? It's out there. But what about valuations? What about earnings growth? What about the things that ultimately matter long term? We don't care about that. Just tell me how we're going to get to 5,000. Well, we're going to get to 5,000 by $120 billion a month in QE. Why not? Haven't you heard? According to Ed Yardini, we're in, the, we're in the 1920s productivity cycle of the economy. We're about to go through a productive economic boom unlike anything we've seen since the 1920s. It's very bullish. Maybe he's right. But there's big differences between today and in 1920. In 1920, we were creating manufacturing for the automobile. People didn't have autos. All of a sudden, people had cars and they could drive further distances than their horses could go. Because, you know, horses, love them. They can only go so far. <laughs> they got to eat. They got to sleep. They got to poop. You know, those type of things. Cars just need gas. But what cars did and automobiles and trucks allowed people to ship product further, open up new markets, expand production and capabilities, manufacturing capabilities, sales. So that really led to the economic boom. And of course, it wasn't just cars. It was also the entire auto. It was also the entire manufacturing processes were being developed for everything. We could produce more faster expand our market base, railways across the country. Oh my gosh, all of a sudden I can put something or someone on a train in New York and I can take them all the way to California and they don't get shot by Indians. It's cool, right? Huge, huge industrial advances during the 1920s. This is why the economy is growing at 8 9% during the 1920s. We don't have that today. How do we increase productivity? We take on automation that reduces the need for labor. How do we produce more? We outsource it to other countries that will produce it cheaper so we can export inflation and import deflation. Those are not things that lead to stronger economic growth. Those are things that lead to weaker economic growth. Because what am I doing? I'm suppressing the labor and the wages in the economy. So they have less money to spend. And since we're a 70% driven consumption-based society, you know, you got to have people working and earning money. And this is the thing we keep forgetting, right? Let's give people money to spend. 
awesome. Let's take from some people that are working. Let's take their tax dollars, give them to other people who aren't working so they can spend money. That's great. But all you're doing is recycling the same dollar. You're not creating new work, new money through productivity. The thing we should be work, the things should we should be working on, and this is what Roosevelt had right was work programs. Let's get people to work. Let's get them work building dams and bridges and and these type of things. Let's put people to work because they've got to be productive. In order to consume, if if our economy is seventy percent consumption, we have to consume. But we can't consume unless we do what? We have to produce something first. We've got to go to work. It's Monday. We got to go to work. We go to work, we earn a paycheck, and then guess what? We get paid, we can go buy stuff. Just like I was talking about my kids, right? Kids got jobs, all of a sudden they realize that every other Friday when they get paid, they can go out with their friends and do stuff because they got money until I take it all out of their account to pay their car note. (laughs) We got to produce, right? The problem is we've gotten away from the very basic drivers of the economy. And to have an economy like we had in the 1920s, which we can't have today. We need everybody producing and manufacturing and putting their work effort into the economy. That's what creates stronger rates of economic growth, better outcomes for markets and economies long term, and gives the government the ability to start reducing the debt. But... That's why this ain't the 1920s. And that's why we have bigger challenges ahead. Wraps up the show for the day. Get by the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Our latest blog post is out now talking about the Nikkei. Also, our daily market commentary. Click on that link on the front page. Get our updated daily market commentary for today. You subscribe to it as well. Have it delivered directly to your email inbox at 7.30 every morning before the market opens. Tell you what to watch for, what the market's going on there. Realinvestmentadvice.com. You'll find it all there. See you tomorrow. It's a rich man's world